Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar. My name is Melissa Burke. I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I'll be your host for this webinar. This webinar is part of a series in which we share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools for the Australian life sciences community. Each month we hear from local and international peers who pre present on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will help you to achieve your best environmental, medical and or agricultural research. You can keep up to date with the latest Australian Biocommons news and events using the links that you can see on your screen. Before we begin, we will take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. Today, we are joining you from the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people in Brisbane, and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Professor Kiman Macau to speak to us about uh, the popular R package mixomics and how it's being used and applied in different multi-omics settings. Kiman is the Director of Melbourne Integrative Genomics at the School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Melbourne. She has a long and distinguished career in bioinformatics and applied statistics with a strong research focus and is one of the driving forces behind Mixomics. She is one of Australia's Science Technology Australia's um, superstars of STEM and is the recipient of the Australian Academy of Sciences Moran Medal for Applied Statistics. Welcome to the webinar, Kimon. I'll now hand over you to start the presentation. So my, um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to present, uh, to give you an overview of the Mixomics package and some of the methods, some of the key methods we have developed in the, in the package. So um, just to give you a bit of context, um, I have a, I lead a, a multidisciplinary group who has expertise in statistics and computational biology. Uh, my team is composed of statisticians, bioinformaticians, data analysts, and also software developers. Uh, we're very strong in developing uh, methods that are, can be used uh, in a practical setting, um, developing software for the community. And you will see throughout my talk that actually our methods are non-parametric. And so they can often be applied on any different types of data, um, regardless of the technology that has been used. And uh, just for a final note, uh, the Mixomics team has been um, selected as a finalist for the Australian Eureka Prize last year. So this is the outline of my talk. I'm uh, just going to give you a context of what the omics data are uh, and what we are looking for in omics data. Uh, one brief slide on the Mixomics software, and then I will describe the different methods. They all based in the same uh, on the same concept of PLS, which stands for partial least square regression or projection to latent structures. I'll then give you some brief omics examples, um, and I will finish the talk giving you uh, an overview of the different extension methods um, that we have developed recently also based on PLS methods. Um, so just to give you a bit of context of where we sit and what we have uh, achieved in the past 20 or 30 years in um, molecular biology or research, um, we uh, moved from a reductionist type of approach um, where often we had a hypothesis on a single gene, we would uh, we would knock off that gene, and then um, we would perform or conduct a statistical test to answer a biological question. And from this reductionist approach, we moved to a holistic approach, which is much more complicated because now we're measuring thousands of molecules. And what I mean by molecules are genes, metabolites, proteins, um, you know, different things. Um, and there is no clear um, hypothesis that is driving those experiments. And so that makes the statistical analysis actually quite challenging because uh, the, you know, it's difficult to uh, apply an appropriate test because we don't really know what the actual question is. Um, 
And this is when we started to have all these omics data that we realized, I realized during my PhD that um, it was really important to work at the interface uh, between statistics, bioinformatics, and biology in order to make sense of the results that we have. Um, the challenges are that we have an unlimited amount of data from different sources and technological platforms. Um, there's a lot of computational issues that we need to anticipate on. Um, it's quite clear now with the advent of single cell um, technologies. Because often the number of samples is really small, it's very difficult to validate the results statistically. Um, and so we have to rely a lot on the biological interpretation in order to validate um, our analysis. Um, and this interpretation is key to actually tell us whether we're in the right direction or not in our analysis. And finally, um, we constantly have to keep up with um, those new technologies. And each technology and each platform has different quirks, different data characteristics, which means that you need to be you know, quite um, fluent um, and quite creative in using different statistical analysis methods. Um, during the talk, I'm going to talk a lot about omics uh, or the OMS. Um, and I actually mean uh, all different types of um, omics assays from transcriptomics, which is the study of all transcripts, proteomics, metabolomics, but I will also talk about the microbiome. And often I will refer to these data as, uh, or these data sets are data blocks. Um, and that can also include clinical data. So any type of data that is um, often high throughput um, can be included in the analysis um, to the exception of data that are categorical, for example, uh, you know, yes, no kind of um, um, data. And what we know from this data is that actually the biological dogma doesn't apply all the time. Like it's not a linear relationship between most of those omics. Sometimes it all cross talk. Um, and this is why um, the methods I'm going to talk about are quite useful to explore uh, the relationship between those data sets. So as I mentioned before, um, there's a new omics research field that has been established. Um, as a reminder, uh, we started from you know, a single gene approach. Uh, about 20 years ago, we moved to the, the single omics. So here you would measure uh, the expression of all genes on uh, multiple individuals. And uh, the same for the proteins or the metabolites or even the microbiome. And now, uh, in the past 10 years or so, um, we have moved towards a multi-omics assays, where often those assays are performed on the same individuals. And what we're looking for are how we can extract correlated patterns or certain associations within each data set, as well as between data sets. And so this holistic approach is quite useful. It gives us a lot of insights about the biological system we're looking at, but it's very messy and there's a, there's a lot of data to work through. And so our approach really are um, focusing on reducing the dimension of the data. So we can focus only on the most important and interesting information from the data. Uh, we can generate new hypotheses that we then try to bring back to a more reductionist type of approach where we can validate um, those results. Um, and we can continue to you know, do more experiments to refine those hypotheses. So often uh, multi-omics are um, referred to as a fishing expedition, uh, but really the, the idea of those multi-omics is that they should help us eventually to actually generate new hypotheses and, and narrow it down to only a few molecules that we should focus on for the, the next stage of the study. There are different types of data integration approaches, um, and I'm sure you've um, you know, encountered some of them. The one I'm focusing on are called data uh, matrix factorization techniques, and I will explain what it means, but basically it's reducing the dimension of the data into a set of vectors here that are much, much more, that are smaller um, and easier to deal with. But you also have um, Bayesian approaches um, and 
I think I'm pretty sure you have, for those of you who have analyzed multi-omics data in, before, uh, I'm sure you have used network-based approach. Um, so this approach is basically um, calculating the correlation between pairs of variables. So for example, genes and proteins and metabolites, and then setting up a threshold so you only keep the pairs that have a high correlation and then you can show them into a network. Uh, but early days and still now, uh, people were focusing a lot on this multi-step approach where they would analyze each omic layer individually. For example, they can do um, some differential expression tests. Um, they would then identify the top differentially expressed genes and the top differentially abundant protein and so on. And then they would look at the overlap at the gene level, for example, or you know, the correlation between them in order to make sense of those data. So uh, just to talk a little bit about Mixomics, um, it's a, a software that is hosted in Bioconductor. We actually have a lot of methods in Mixomics. I will only focus on a few. Um, and um, basically, as you can see from this plot, uh, you have different types of inputs depending on how many data sets you want to integrate or you want to explore. Um, and based on that, you will choose an appropriate method. And you can see from there that actually um, the visualization graphics, uh, whether they're the sample plot or the variable plots, they are similar across methods. And that's because all methods use the same underlying principles of data dimensional reduction. So in my talk today, um, I'm going to focus on different types of approach. The one that focus only on one omic layer I'm um, just going to briefly introduce PCA and also PLSDA. And then I'm going to talk about what we, uh, an integration scheme called N integration, where the data sets are measured on the same N samples. And I briefly, so I talk about uh, PLS and Diablo. And I briefly talk also about Mint, which is another framework to integrate data sets that are measured on the same P variables, for example, the same P genes, but across different cohorts. Um, and those methods uh, can be supervised. So you can do a classification or, uh, or non-supervised. So you can do um, you know, just exploration of the data sets. Okay, um, so I start with the methods um, and just uh, to give you um, an idea of where we sit, um, th those methods are multivariate. And basically what it means is that they consider all these molecules together in the statistical model. And so that really has shifted this paradigm of this one gene hypothesis, because as I was explained before, um, we have um, you know, different molecules to take into account in a holistic way. Uh, and we hope that by doing this, we can obtain deeper insights into biological systems. So instead of looking at a univari a univariate biomarkers, which you usually um, identify through um, you know, t-tests or univariate tests such as ANOVA, we're going to look into combinations of markers. Uh, we're going to reduce the dimension of the data and that we, I will show you how you can get a better understanding and better insights about the biological systems. Those methods are really amenable for the integration of multiple sources of data. And I will also uh, talk quite a bit about supervised analysis, which is when uh, you know that your samples or your individuals belong to very specific groups, whether they have different treatments or different stage of disease, and we're interested in sample prediction. So a very common multivariate method is PCA, principal component analysis. Um, but I will also focus a lot on projection to latent structures, the PLS methods, because they're very good for data integration. Now, before I move on to describing those methods, I know people are really interested in um, integrating omics data. It's like one of the flavor of the decade. But I think before you do that, you have to ask yourself, what are your expectations from integrating this data? Because you can have many. Uh, some people want to understand the role of each omics in the biological system. For example, they may say, is the gene, are gene expression data uh, more predictive than if I use the proteins data. Um, they want to, they may want to understand the relationship between those omics data sets. For example, you know, are there genes that are highly correlated with proteins? 
And what is the type of correlation? Is that a positive or a negative correlation? Uh, some people are interested in what we call variable selection, which is um, selecting signatures, combinations of genes and proteins and metabolites that will help us um, either to predict or explaining what is what might be the molecular mechanism underlying uh, a certain biological system. And other people are interested only in predictions, so they may not be interested in the signature, they just want to do uh, you know use the methods as a sort of black box and say well here's the input and as an output I want to predict whether this individual uh, is a case or a control. Uh, and often uh, when you give all these options uh, to uh, people they say well I want to do all of this. Um, and so um, I think it's important when you use those methods that you ask yourself exactly what what is it that you're trying to achieve. And I often say to the mixomics users that um, they should ask themselves, how does the perfect result look like? Um, and then from there, they should be able to go back to backtrack and choose the appropriate method for their question or what they're hoping to get from the data. Okay, so I start first with principal component analysis because it's such a you know popular tool, especially when data are big. And I just want to um, introduce some concepts using PCA. So most of you know that PCA answers the question, what are the major sources of variation in my data? So we start from a large data matrix. You have your, usually the number of samples pretty small, I mean, between 10 and 50. But the number of features or variables that you have can be quite large. So for example, for gene expression data, you may have 20,000 genes. This is very difficult to deal with uh, from a data analysis perspective because there's a lot of correlated signal. Um, and also the number of samples is very small. Um, often, if you do a regression, um, you need to inverse those matrices. And it's really hard when um, those matrices are of that shape. And so, I want to introduce the concept of, fa of matrix factorization, which is basically decomposing this large data matrix into a set of vectors um, that are much smaller in their dimension and their size. Um, those set of vectors are called components, the principal components, and the loading vectors. And the idea of matrix factorization is similar to factorization in mathematics. It means that if I multiply my components and my loading vectors, I should be able to go back into the original matrix, plus or minus some noise that I removed and so on, but the, the, it is an approximation. Okay, so how does PCA work? Uh, I'm sure that you all know what a, a principal component is, um, but it's important to understand how, how it works, and, you know, how it's actually a PCA is built. So we have one individual here, I will call him Bob. Um, and Bob is described by 20,000 genes. So he actually lives in a dimension of size 20,000. So that's way too much. So you could say, look, it's way too much information. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to calculate the average uh, gene expression levels of all those genes. Um, and that's going to give me one value for Bob. And that's going to summarize those 20,000 genes expression values. And so that means that in order to calculate Bob's score, um, I will weight each gene the same way. It will be each gene is going to be assigned a coefficient that is one divided by P, where P is the number of genes. And so my loading vectors is going to tell me that. It's going to say, well, each value here should be the same because each gene is assigned a similar weight in that linear combination. And then you can use the same principle for the, for, for the second individual, Jane. I do the same, I calculate the, the average. Um, and so the, you know, the, the loading vector doesn't change anyway, but you use the, the same formula to calculate the score of the second individual. And you do that for all individuals. Um, and then you may say, well, actually just the average is not enough. I need something else. Um, maybe I can calculate the variance or I can, you know, whatever you want to do. And that's going to be a second component, which is supposed to explain another source of variation in the data. Um, so how do, so the, the key of PCA is really to identify or to calculate those loading vectors. Because, you know, I gave you a very simple example where each gene has the same uh, coefficient. But in fact, it's not. 
Um, in fact, each gene is going to have different coefficients. And the, the way we find those coefficients is that we need, it's an optimization uh, problem in statistics. We need to find the optimal coefficients so that the variance of the component when I calculate it is maximal. And it's maximal because uh, PCA maximizes the variance in the data. So that's how uh, PCA is calculated. Basically is uh, once you find the loading vectors, then you can calculate uh, each of those components. The other thing I want to say is that um, each loading vector is going to be associated with a particular component. So usually you have the first loading vector associated with the first component, and then you may have a second loading vector that is associated to the second component and so on. Um, and you may have as many components as you want, but usually because we're interested in um, dimensional reduction, we're only going to consider maybe three to five, depending on the data. Okay, so now that I uh, have explained to you how PCA works, I'm going to now extend the complexity of the problem. I, so this is a, a discriminant analysis case where I not only have my gene expression data, but I also have an outcome that tells me whether um, that individual is in group one, group two, or group three. And I want to integrate this information together. So the question we want to answer is, can I discriminate my samples according to the known groups? And you use very simple, similar principles to PCA. You do a matrix uh, factorization. Uh, we decompose um, this information together into components and loading vectors as well. But in order to find the loading vectors this time, we asked the method to maximize the covariance between um, the expression data and the outcome that is here. And for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the concept of covariance, it's very similar to, a cor to correlation. Correlation is bounded between minus one and plus one, and the covariance is not. So it can be between minus infinity and plus infinity, but the concept is the same. And so here, what differs from PCA is that first, we include the outcome information, which means that the, the PLSDA components are going to be very different from a PCA, because now they are going to try to uh, find the optimal combination of genes that reflect the outcome. Uh, the other thing is also that we, um, included feature selection in the loading vectors. So I told you that in the loading vector, we have those coefficients. And in fact, uh, the importance of those coefficients or their value tells us how important a given gene is to explain the outcome and to explain the component. So you can imagine that you could focus only on the top genes that, has the, that have the maximum weight in these loading vectors uh, in order to calculate the component. And so this is how we do feature selection. We use what something called lasso penalization. And basically it's going to shrink those regression, those coefficient weights to zero. So that in the end, you know, in your loading vector, you don't have 20,000 values. You may have like 10 values and the rest are zero. And so that means that when you calculate your component, your component is only based on the linear combination of the genes that have a non-zero weight. And so you can do feature selection that way. So um, I told you before for PCA, it's the same for PLSDA, the components are orthogonal, they explain different things. And so maybe you would have one component that explain the outcome. Um, and it would be based only on say 10 genes that have been selected in the loading vector. And then maybe the second component is going to explain a bit more the outcome. And it's gonna be based on another, I don't know, maybe five genes that are different from the, the first, the genes selected on the first dimension, um, and that are going to uh, basically help you to continue to uh, classify those individuals or patients. Um, so what is known from PCA and PLSDA is uh, getting the plots uh, of, uh, to represent your sample. So basically you extract those components here, you plot them one against each other, and that's going to represent this new space that is much smaller in dimension than the original space. So this is the kind of plot that you get here where each dot represents a sample or an individual. 
And here, uh, the location is um, defined by the first component and the second component. So what it means is really that we are visualizing now um, those samples or those individuals into a much smaller space created by either PCA here or PLS discriminant analysis here. This is a very old microarray data set from a small round blue um, tumor. I uh, had 63 samples and about 3,000 genes. In PCA, um, I, I showed you that, you know, you decompose uh, only the gene expression data matrix. So you actually don't include any information whatsoever about the type of tumor. Um, so this is what we call an unsupervised analysis. Um, and that's why I colored my dots in the same color, just to show you, actually, this is what we get because this is what we ask the method. Um, and so what you're interested in here is to look at similarities between those samples. And maybe you can say, well, actually, I can see two groups of samples, or I can see four groups of samples. In the discriminant analysis case, I showed you that we include the outcome information in the method. And in that case, I can now color my dots because this is exactly what I told the method to do. And you can see that this discrimination is not too bad. Um, and what is interesting is if you look at those two plots, you can say, well, actually, they're the same groups, right? Like this one is the gray one, and this one is the green one, and it's not. Because PCA is here to maximize the variance in your data, and that variance can be due to uh, the sample groups, but it can be due to any other things. It can be due to sex, it can be due to whatever you have in your data. Whereas discriminant analysis is specifically told to discriminate your sample groups. So you will get different results. The components are different. Also, uh, people ask me, but how come you know, I don't maximize or my, the amount of explained variance I have in discriminant analysis is quite low compared to PCA? And I would say, yes, that's normal. Because in PCA, you want to maximize the variance of your components. In PLSDA, you don't. You want to maximize the covariance between your data and the outcome. So they're very different methods. They're not gonna give you, most of the time, they will not give you the same results. Okay, um, moving on now to the N integration methods, there's two. Uh, there's the classic PLS, uh, which has been um, developed to integrate two omics data sets. Um, so for example, here you have gene expression data and metabolites, they're measured on the same samples. You can see from the graphic that it is also a matrix factorization technique. We, you know, we decompose each of those matrices into components. Here they're called latent variables and loading vectors. But the way we integrate this information is that while we're trying to find the optimal loading vectors associated to the X data set or the Y data set, we want to maximize the covariance between the latent variables from the, the X data set and from the Y data set. So this is how we integrate this information. We're actually asking the PLS, can you find an optimal linear combination of genes that is maximally correlated with a linear combination of metabolites for all the individuals that I have in this data set? Um, we also do feature selection here, the same way I explained before. You can penalize some of those um, regression coefficients uh, in the loading vector. And from there, you only work with uh, only a subset of genes or metabolites, and you can identify them really easily. Um, and then that constitutes your signature. Um, so I'm talking about PLS because in the next part of um, this talk, um, when I talk about the extension of the methods, we use PLS a lot. But one method that people are really excited about is um, this method that can integrate multiple omics data sets. So here I represented three data sets, but in fact, we integrated sometimes 15 data sets. And they all, what is important is that they're all measured on the same samples. Um, and you can also include an outcome as well. So same principles. We don't work with those big uh, data matrices. Instead, we work with um, latent variables, those components and the loading vectors. But this time, we will ask the components to be uh, maximally covariant in pairs so that you can identify a linear combination of genes that is maximally covariant with a linear combination of proteins. 
which is also itself maximal co covariant with a linear combination of metabolites, as well as explain the outcome. So you can see there's a lot of things going on in this method. You can also uh, do variable selection and so on. What is important to remember is that while we integrate all this information, we we'll still keep those components separately. Um, and I show you why is because um, they give us a lot of insight into how is the method working, whether it's integrating the data well or not. So I'm going to extract those components from each of those data sets, and I'll show you what happens here. This is a um, TCGA data set in breast cancer. The outcome is the different subtypes of uh, breast cancer. And we have four different data sets, mRNA, microRNA, methylation, and proteins. And each dot here represents one sample. And so this is just component one versus component two from the mRNA data set. And this is component one versus component two from the microRNA data set, and so on. So you can see from these plots that they look similar because this is what we're asking the method to do. We're asking to maximize the covariance between all those data sets. But you can also see some subtle differences. For example, the microRNA data set is much more messy, and, and so is the, the protein. Um, so when you start to integrate a lot of data sets together, uh, you can look at those plots and say, well, actually, um, maybe I should consider removing some of those data sets because the integration is not working very well. Um, I have to say also that people tend to jump in directly into the multi-omics integration. And I would say, no, do not do this. Actually, you should do a PCA first. You should then do a discriminant analysis on each data set before you move on to the integration, because it's really important to make sure the data are OK, uh, make sure they behave the, the way you were expecting uh, before you move to the multi-omics integration. Because once you're in the multi-omics integration, it's really difficult then if things don't work out, and a lot of things don't work out uh, in those studies, you don't know where, wh why. Uh, so it's really important to take it step by step and you know, do not hesitate to go back again and try a few different things. So I talk a lot about the samples, which is um, basically coming from the components, uh, from the uh, matrix factorization. But you can also look at the loading vectors. I told you they were very important to do uh, variable selection. But they're also very important because they tell us how correlated um, those features are. And so we created a lot of plots. I'm just showing you two, but there's heaps in exomics. Uh, one is just a circus plot. Um, so um, each, um, each variable that has been selected is um, displayed here on, the, on, the, on those quadrants. So you have mRNA, proteins, and microRNA. And then you have a line when there's either a uh, positive correlation or a negative correlation between those different omics um, and above a certain correlation cutoff. You don't have to put that cutoff, but maybe for visualization, it's easier for you. And so you can start to visualize your signature, your multi-omic signature, and see how correlated um, those variables are. And we have some other plots as well to explain how those variables relate to uh, specific sample groups, you know, are they overexpressed in a specific group or not? Uh, you can also have, you know, those kind of heat maps that also show the correlation structure between um, those different variables um, and, you know, what is their types, for example. So yeah, you can have a look on our website. We give heaps of examples on, you know, the different graphics and how you, you can interpret them. Um, and the last type of method I want to talk about is the P integration method, where basically you have um, different data sets that have been measured on different cohorts or different studies, but say on the same P genes. So that's why we call it P integration. Um, this applies when um, you, know, you want to collate different studies, you want to increase uh, the sample size of your data, and you want to combine them and analyze them. If you do that in a very naive way, so you just you know, collate them all and put it into a PCA plot, you will see a very strong study effect because those studies are independent. Uh, they use different platforms, different protocols. And so it's going to be, uh, the study effects much, is going to be much greater than the, the biological effect you're expecting to see. 
And so we developed this method called MINT. Um, it's a, some sort of meta-analysis, uh, but it actually combines those data sets because when we started to do some meta-analysis on those data sets, you know, you do an analysis on each data set individually, and then you look at the overlap of the results, and we realized that there was no overlap between the genes we selected. And that's because those studies are, have a very small sample size. And then there's this, um, you know, different protocols involved and so on. So it actually didn't work. Um, so, but using a, a PLS type model, again, you know, using matrix factorization techniques, we are able now to integrate this information so that uh, we can identify uh, loading vectors that are um, the same across all these different studies. Um, and a great output is that you get uh, what we call the, those global components. And they're supposed to summarize um, the information from all these data sets combined. But you also have the study specific components, which tell us a little bit more about how does each study behave in comparison with the other ones. Um, and again, we do feature selection, so you can identify a molecular signature that is consistent across those individual studies. So I'll show you, it's actually a method that uh, you know, took, a, took us a while to um, publish, um, but now it's used quite a bit. Um, so this is a, um, just an example where we uh, looked at RNA-seq data from stem cells. Um, there are three different groups of stem cells, fibroblast, uh, human embryonic stem cells in orange, and human-induced pluripotent stem cells in gray. And the symbols represent um, the different studies. So here we're combining four studies. So you can see this is a mint output. You can see we still do have a study effect for some, for example, for the fibroblast, and not so much for the other groups. Um, but this is the global components, and you can have a look at the study-specific components to see whether the integration worked or not. So here it works pretty well, uh, but I can say that maybe study three, you know, there's a bit of overlap between the gray and the orange. Uh, so again, you know, you can inspect your results and say, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't include that study, and so on. Um, what is great about this method is once you collated quite a few studies, you can work on, you can look at the prediction. And so this is what we've done, you know, we integrated eight studies and we would do the training of the mint on seven studies. And then we would test whether we can predict the outcome on the eighth study uh, and see how, you know, how good we were. Was the signature okay? Was the mint model okay to predict um, the different groups of samples? Um, and your our accuracy was actually quite good, and it was only based on a very small signature genes. Um, and later on, we did that also um, with my collaborators in France. They work in um, uh, microbial processes in anaerobic digestion. And just to show you that it doesn't only work on gene expression, it actually also worked in uh, 16S microbiome. So I just want to summarize on those methods because I know there's quite a few we covered. Uh, but basically, um, when you start your omics integration journey, first, you should go step by step. So first start single omics and then an integration, for example, um, and choose the method that answers your question. Um, for example, you know, do you want to do a class? Are you interested in classifying your samples? Or if you're not, you know, should you use a PCA? Are you interested in integrating um, data sets also classifying your samples or not, and how many data sets you have and so on that will decide um, which path you, you want to take. But each of those methods have been design, designed to answer a very specific question. And people often ask me why, why there is no p-value in mixomics. Um, and I've, the, my answer is that it doesn't uh, really make sense in multivariate data analysis because um, Originally, people think about a p-value in a univariate context. They want to have a p-value per gene, and they want to assess whether the gene is differently expressed or not. In multivariate data analysis, as I was saying, you consider genes in combination or proteins in combination. And so you can get one p-value for the combination of all the genes and the proteins. This is easy to do. You can do permutation tests. And um, the p-value will tell you, oh, yeah, the result is different from a random result, but it's not going to tell you what is the differential expression of a given gene. 
if you want to do this, then use um, univariate tests for that. Um, so this is why we don't have p-values in our tiraria data analysis, or not often. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to um, two examples, um, and then I'll cover quickly uh, some extensions of those methods. So this um, study is a multi-omic studies in infants. Um, they measured five different types of omics in two cohorts, uh, new boards from Gambia. And then we used uh, another cohort from PNG for validation. I'm not going to talk about the validation, but actually uh, our method and our prediction is um, behaving really well and is predicting really well on the validation that I said. So those new bonds were sampled at um, different uh, days after they were born. So people did a, a, uni, a single omics analysis um, where first um, they identified the number of genes that were uh, differentially expressed between day one and day zero, or day three and day zero, or day seven, day zero. And they looked at whether the genes were upregulated up or downregulated. And the number of genes and proteins and metabolites that are um, differentially expressed is really big. And so once you start to, to, to visualize them into a network, it's really hard to see anything here. Um, so just to uh, explain what they did, uh, they analyzed each layer individually, and then they calculated the Pearson correlation. And this is just a, uh, a visualization of the network. And you can see it's quite dense, but it doesn't really tell us much. If you do a Diablo approach where you integrate and you specifically ask the method to unravel the correlation structure of those data sets, then you can see a much cleaner um, network. Uh, each component is going to focus on a, a very particular aspect of the data and um, the, the pathways that are involved actually make a lot of sense. So we found in the integration, we found um, you know, results that we couldn't extract from single omics analysis because it was a very subtle signal. But we also found some common information that we also had found in the single omics analysis. So that's something for you to consider is uh, you will find some new knowledge. It's really hard then to validate, um, but you also find some old knowledge that you could have uh, obtained from other types of analysis. Uh, the other example uh, is uh, looking at the microbiome and the omics in the host. Uh, this is in type 1 diabetes. Um, we have proteomics, metaproteomics, uh, which are microbial proteins, and also uh, taxa from the microbiome. So um, um, Patrick um, analyzed this data with Diablo, and I just want to show you some of the results because this is outside mixomics, but it just shows you how much work you have to do in terms of interpretation afterwards. Um, so basically, he uh, applied Diablo and he identified this multi-omic signature of microbial proteins, uh, bacteria, um, and also the, the human proteins. And then he visualized them into a cytoscape network. And this is what is represented here. It's quite busy. Uh, but basically, you have some bacteria here, you have some human proteins, um, you have some microbial proteins, and each link represents how correlated they are. And the box plots represent you know, the, uh, the abundance uh, of those bacteria between the sample groups. And once you have this, you can start to uh, interpret those networks uh, and look for you know, um, different types of functions, for example, uh, looking back into the literature. So just to say that those methods are really great to uh, narrow down this, uh, or you know, to simplify the signal uh, and to give you some insights into what's going on, but they're not going to tell you how interesting it is, biologically speaking. You, you still have to do a lot of work in terms of interpretation. Okay, um, I'm going to move on quickly to um, just different extensions. The one is we've done a lot of work on time course data. Uh, the first one is just looking at multi-omics um, data that are also measured across time. So now uh, your data are in 3D very difficult to handle. Um, and so we propose to reduce the dimension into 2D using splines. And those splines are actually very good to also estimate missing time points or the missing values. And once we have those splines, so they are um, you know, shown here, uh, each spline represents the profile of uh, one gene or one metabolite or one bacteria. 
then we use PLS and PCA to um, identify correlated patterns across those splines. So if you're interested in this, you can have a look. We have uh, two publications here uh, on how to use those methods. Um, we're also now looking at modeling networks of microbial communities across time. So this is an example where we have a microbiome uh, experiment in mice and they have um, different types of diets. Um, and then we look at the, um, the sample, the fecal samples across time. And then we infer the, the, the correlation networks uh, between those bacteria. Uh, but we use PLS to do this because it's very good to remove the noise and spurious correlation. Uh, the PLS actually takes into account the past data as well. So it's in a full longitudinal setting. And we estimate the partial correlation, which are much more robust than correlation um, between those bacteria. Uh, so this is work in progress, uh, but we will have a manuscript out very soon. Um, and finally, um, I just want to touch on very quickly about another type of PLS method we used for the continuous annotation of single cells. So for those of you who work in that field, often you use a reference um, data set and you have very particular phenotypes you're interested in, for example, cell types. Um, and you want to query a new data set and say, what is the cell type uh, of my cells? Uh, you can do that in a hard classification framework where uh, the method's going to say, well, it's cell type A, B, C, D. Or you can do it, and this is what we propose, in a more continuous case where we say, actually, um, it's most likely to be cell A or maybe a bit of cell B. So that's very useful when you don't know what the cell type of your cells is and if your cell type is actually unknown. So we use PLS for that. Uh, we integrate uh, the reference data set and the phenotype. And phenotype can be anything from you know, cell type or sample source. We're able to then extract the regression coefficients from there. And then we uh, reconstruct the, the data matrices um, in order to predict the phenotype of the query data sets. So what is here? Um, and uh, from there, you can then visualize this phenotype space. It's really insightful. So I'll show you that. Um, I'll show you that on spatial transcriptomics. So I'll show you the prediction of each cell uh, for each cell type. So this part here. And I'll show you how we can then combine um, all these different predicted phenotypes um, in, uh, in that example. Uh, so for spatial transcriptomics, we have um, the location of cells in a, in a given tissue. Um, and this is uh, what we're supposed to get, the full picture, uh, with the different spatial niche of all these cells in a lung cancer. So we use this five space approach uh, to query um, this, um, this data onto a, a reference atlas. And if you then ask uh, to predict a specific cell type, for example, AT1, this is what you get here. This is this kind of map where you get some sort of continuous value that's going to say, well, this cell is actually a bit more AT1 than the blue cells. Whereas if you use a hard classification, which is more like a yes-no prediction, then you're going to see a lot, some red dots like that, but not much. Um, and it doesn't actually correspond. So this is the tumor here that is around here. So you can do that for every cell type by predicting their phenotype in a continuous way, or you can also combine all the phenotypes into a combination of the 61 cell types. And this is what you see here, uh, and that gives us a much better representation of where the tumor might be. Um, and also based on this, on the PLS, you can also have a look at um, how correlated the, the phenotypes or the cell types are. So you can get this kind of plot where you start to understand that, you know, AT1 is very similar to uh, this activated stress response type of cell and so on. So you can start to really unravel what's going on um, in the data. So I finish here uh, by saying that if you're keen to start with Mixomics, I think uh, the best way is, of course, to install the package, but have a look at all the vignettes, the, all the tutorials we have on our website. You can ask your questions on the forum. Uh, you can also report the bugs if you experience any. Uh, you can come to our workshops. Um, and often I do also welcome visitors in my lab um, so that they're coming with the data. Um, and together we work on you know, what is the best analysis for them. 
Um, and just uh, to summarize, I've talked about data-driven approach. So, you know, I've never used uh, a priori biological knowledge uh, in those analyses. Um, the data sets you want to integrate, they have to be in the, they have to have the same dimension, whether it's on the same N samples or the same P genes. Uh, we use uh, data dimension reduction techniques using PLS, and I hope I could show you that it was easy for interpretation and visualization. We focus a lot on feature selection because that really helps us to narrow down uh, the signal to only a few set of genes or proteins or molecular signature. Um, and also, don't be afraid to use both univariate and multivariate approaches in your studies. They all they all complementary, in and they all very um, data specific. Thank you. Thank you, Kiman. That was fantastic. We do have time for questions now. If you have a question, please write that into the Q and A box, and we'll do our best to answer that for you. Uh, just to head off the question that always comes. This recording will be shared with you. I will email that out to you in the next week or so, and I'll include some of those links that Kim Han had on her last slide as well. So to, to kick off the questions, the first one that we have is, how does Mixomics facilitate the integration of multiomics data and what advantages does it have over traditional methods? And is it benchmarked against other tools as well? Yeah, so I think uh, my talk was, uh, you know, I, I dwelled a lot on the difference between univariate and multivariate methods in terms of their construction and also the insights that you get. So sometimes you get similar insights and often you will get also very subtle insights that you couldn't get from, you know, um, classical univariate approaches. Um, so we, we have benchmarked all our methods. Each method has a paper. And in each paper, we have to do extensive benchmark. And then afterwards, some people may have proposed other methods, and I'm pretty sure they then benchmarked our method against theirs. So uh, you just have to dig uh, into those, um, those papers. Uh, but basically, remember that sometimes a method works really well on your data, and then it doesn't work well on other data. Uh, it's very data specific. So you my uh, advice is do not stick to only one type of method or tool that you think is going to work all the time because it doesn't. You have to try. You have to have an extensive toolkit, understand the limitations of the methods, and then um, you know make sure that the the question you have will can be answered by those methods. Thank you. The next question, and you touched a little bit on this in the presentation that the kind of the mixomics is the first part of the question, then you need to do the biological interpretation. Do you have any recommendations for how you go about doing that once you've got your data out of mixomics? Yeah, so people do a lot of gene ontology, uh, look at the pathways, look at in the literature and see whether in the right direction. So that's more like looking into the literature and existing knowledge. What is difficult is that when you're trying to create new knowledge, you won't have that. Um, and so often we use, um, you know, validation data sets or external data sets where we can test in silico whether the prediction is working well or not. And that will tell us if we are in the right direction. So, yeah, it's a, it's a combination of relying on existing knowledge as well as how do you validate in silico your results. Yes, lots of, lots of different directions you can take there. Turning now to questions that are coming in live. The first one is for Diablo. Do samples need to be matched across every omics layer or is it okay if some samples are present or absent in different layers? Yes, yeah, so David, I, um, you know, I was talking about the covariance and maximize or calculating the covariance or the correlation between components. And so um, if they're not the same size, then it's, we, we can't even calculate it. And so the, you know, the, the, the straight answer is no, you can't. If you're missing some samples, you have to work only on the, the samples that are uh, across all the layers. But I think there are some, there's, there's some papers that mention that either they, they, they um, replicate some data, for example, or, you know, some samples to kind of, pre, you know, pretend um, that they, they have, you know, full data sets. So that's something you could also consider is reuse one sample, but you randomize that, of course, or reuse one sample to fill up the gap if you don't want to lose all your samples. 
And then sticking with the theme of numbers, but looking to the time omics section, is there a limitation on the number of time points or study participants for that model? Uh, the number of time points, it works well between uh, three to five time points. After that, it becomes uh, much more convoluted because you, you can imagine your profiles are you know, pretty long and they have all different shapes. Um, and so in that case, yeah, you can look maybe uh, on next paper on the microbial network or, you know, similar pro, it doesn't have to be microbiome, um, this uh, network modeling, because this better for more than, you know, five time points. Um, and yeah, the, the number of participants has to be large enough, I would say maybe, I don't know, 10 participants per group because we estimate those splines or we estimate correlations. So we need to have enough uh, samples to start with. Great, thank you. Uh, this question is from someone who is saying that they, they might not just want the information that's shared between omics type. Is there a way in mixomics to basically PCA out combining many omics types to get what information is unique to the different omics layers? Yeah, I know. So Paul, the, the, those methods are really focusing on the, you know, the, the similar patterns between data sets. Um, so I think, yeah, if you have a single omic approach, you can start to decipher that. But maybe other methods, I'm thinking maybe of MOFA, will tell you more about what is common and what is not, co not common. Uh, whereas our methods are really focusing on the covariance. So it's like what is common between those data sets. And the last question for today, for today as we're running out of time is, have you tried integrating RNA sequencing data with data derived from high content imaging? Uh, we only try what I showed you before with the special transcriptomics so far. Uh, but yeah, we, this is also something we're going to work on in the, in the coming three years. I have uh, a PhD student and we're going to look at, um, you know, brain imaging and, and integrate that with different omics. I'm happy to answer all your other questions by email on the discourse forum if you, if you want to send it. Excellent. Thank you. I was just going to add the same. I can see that there's quite a lot of extra questions that we haven't had time for. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them via email, or you can jump onto the Mixomics forum, which I think is a good idea anyway, because there'll be other people who can jump in there too. So a last few things to share with you before we wrap up the webinar. Some things that can help you learn a bit more about multi-omics. Firstly, you can join our multi-omics mailing list for updates on related projects that are underway at the Biocommons, or you can subscribe to our Biocommons newsletter, for the latest news events and updates as well. This month, we have quite a few different webinars. So coming up next week, we have a webinar on the Australian Biocommons Leadership Share, which is helping people access the infrastructure they need to do their data analysis. And we also have a webinar on MAVDB, which is a database for high throughput functional assay data. All the information about upcoming events is available on our website. We will leave it there for today. Thank you again, Kiman, for sharing your time and expertise with us. And thank you to everyone for joining us. The Australian Biocommons is enabled by ANCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding. That's all for today. Thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.